Boa noite a todos. Meu nome é Samuel Carvalho, sou estudante de graduação em Stanford. Good evening, everyone. I am a co-leader at BSV. It is such an honor to welcome you to the first panel of Brazil Silicon Valley 2021. This is the first step we take this year in terms of increasing the competitiveness of Brazil through innovation and technology. We want to leave behind policies and partisanship to talk about the Brazil that works. Throughout the year, we will listen from people who have been confronting the challenges of investing and seeing the change we need in our country. I would like to first thank our sponsors for all the support they give us. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. Especially, I would like to thank Software Group for having us uh, support us during this panel. I would also like to thank BSV Team, a group of Stanford and Berkeley students dedicated to work in these past few weeks, allowing this event to take place. This year, we continue to take important steps and increase the uh, reach of our dreams beyond this conference. This week, we will launch the first episode of uh, Brazil Silicon Valley podcast. We interviewed Vitor Lazarte, and he's from Wildlife Studios, one of the Brazilian unicorns. The episode will be available soon in the main streaming platforms. To kick off our panel today, investing in the Brazil of the future in the technology era, evaluation in technology area, I will introduce our speakers. I try to keep the bios short, but of course the speakers have bios that I could talk for hours and hours. Our first guest is Paulo Passoni, a supporter of a conference. Paulo is a managing partner at SoftBank, one of the greatest uh, investors in venture capital. He is one of the co-leaders dedicated to Latin America. Paula invests six of the 16 Brazilian unicorns, and he is part of the board of many startups like Vetex, Quinto Andar, Madeira Madeira. Paulo is a manager at Fundação Getúlio Vargas. He has a master's in public management at Harvard Kennedy School and an MBA in Harvard Business School. Our second guest is Martin Escobar one of the private equity investors and the greatest private equity investors in the world. He is currently managing director and co-president of the global investment at General Atlantic. He's also part of the board of many successful companies such as CSP, Arco. He uh, did economy in Harvard College and MBA in Harvard Business School at Baker's College. As a Baker Scholar. To moderate, I would like to invite Alex Bedding, of course, a great partner in the conference and has helped us present this panel. He's a founder and managing partner at Tangent Capital, a global investment firm. He currently is part of our RPI. He controls brands such as Burger King, Popeyes, and he's a chair of a Crafts Heinz company of the board, of course. He has electro engineering at Pukehiu, MBA in Harvard Business School, as are uh, two uh, guests at Berkers, as a Baker Scholar. I would like to thank the speakers for their participation. At the end, we will have a Q&A with the audience, and I ask you to use the Q&A in the lower part of the screen to submit your questions to the speakers. Also, if you have any specific questions, uh, address them to Paul, Martin, and Alex. I will now pass the floor to Alex for him to start this panel. Samuel, Samuel thank you. Thank uh, Antonia and Anna for having invited me to be in this a wonderful in such a good company here in this panel. It's a pleasure to be here with Paulo and Martin. Of course, but Paulo and SoftBank need no introduction, and Martin even more so. He's a friend for 25 years now. And uh, to start our conversation, today I have as a purpose here in this panel the educational part to continue to learn and to improve as an investor. So I would like to learn from my uh, fellow panelists a little bit of what we're talking about. We're talking about valuation and the era of technology. I see many success cases in uh, these two companies, General Atlantic and Shishpe. Today, uh, they are worth more than uh, RBI. 
I can see a soft bank today with um, amazing capitals and uh, this is what we have to learn. This is how we have to learn, to learn how these valuations work, how this world we're living in works. So it is a great bonus for me to be here with you and to kick off this, this uh, debate with Martin and Paulo. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Uh, to kick off, Alex and I, we've known each other for 27 years. He recruited me to come to Brazil. And I, uh, listening to my bio, he's talking about three Baker scholars. Baker's scholar in Brazil, I guess there are four in the world and three are here today. So in my professional life, the only time that someone asked me about Baker scholars, for those who don't know, uh, everyone here is uh, Stanford. Uh, yeah, so uh, HBS is uh, Baker's College. So Alex, I said, oh, you're also Baker's Scholar? And I asked, oh, cool, cool that you know what it is. And he said, here in Brazil, people do people know by Baker Scholars? I said, no one will ever ask you again because no one cares, no one knows. And for 28 years, the first time I'm saying Baker Scholar, scholar is today. But uh, come on, I'm not going to take your time. So go ahead, Alex and Paulo. So let's talk about, about a bit the basis. You have a great experience, a very successful experience, both Paulo and Martin, in terms of investing in these growth companies. What are the patterns, what are the standards, the uh, main common features you look for in a company in order to invest? It's an interesting question to raise from the standpoint of investments and the different aspiring unicorns that probably are listening to us. I don't know uh, who would like to start. This could be an initial point for us to start our uh, meeting. Well, I want Paulo to start so he won't copy what I have to say. Well, first, I would like to thank uh, the Stanford and Berkeley people, of course. The three of us should have gone to Stanford or Berkeley. I guess we got the wrong college here. But I remember I graduated in 2006. There were zero cases of digital companies at the time. And, uh, <laughs> and we were on the verge of the biggest transition ever. So when I look back into my professional experience, I think about this fact, the fact that we didn't have one single case in terms of what we're doing today. And so what do we consider, at least at SoftBank? We start by the team, the collaborators, to look into the first 10 minutes of the conference, of the conversation, if the team is special, if the founder, man or woman is uh, special. So what do I mean by this? Someone that is able to explain their purpose, their vision, to be able to convince others of their vision, to having thought about all the different obstacles they might be confronted with and with good answers for the main business questions. So it starts by the team, not only the founders, but the general uh, culture of that company. The second point is the size of the market that the company is trying to solve or reach. So what is the problem that they're trying to solve? Is it meaningful? Is it not meaningful? You can't build a company with a very small potential market. It could be super cool uh, as a natural person, as a person, but not as a company. The third point is to think about how this company can make money using technology and how can this be uh, shown uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, business barriers. And also the company traction to see how fast this company is growing. If they're doing everything okay, if the company is making money, if it's growing fast, and we know that the company have a very small market share in the beginning, 0.1%, 1%. So they can uh, double this market share every year at least. So if this solution with a smaller cost would make sense, and two, if it will uh, create value for the client. Every company has to uh, create value for their clients. Uh, customers, be it uh, as a company or a person providing services. 
this is a very basic way to explain how we look at uh, different opportunities and how we analyze what is worthwhile and what isn't. The last thing I would say is we look around the world for success cases. We try to apply this in uh, Latin America, and this will sometimes bring us some advantage. I guess Martin once uh, said this in a podcast, saying that in Latin America, you have the advantage of uh, opening the Wall Street Journal and see the future. And uh, um, remember uh, what Martin said, this is what happens. But having said so, I guess Martin would talk about uh, there, uh, there are uh, atypical examples, companies that were created for the local reality, but they start to dominate the world. Uh, like Shispe will uh, leave or go to other markets. So, Martin, I hope I left something for you to speak, Martin. It's not surprising that we seek, seek the same things. We look for the same features. To add to what Paulo said, the business potential depends on the business model. So for us, what is a good business model? It is one that will generate value, that you have a gross margin, that there is a perceived value for the customer, for the client. And second is the uh, long lasting value that uh, for, you know, you can't copy a soft bank company and have a, a company from SoftBank and just uh, generate value from there. And the um, another thing we try to look into are companies that are highly desirable, not only in terms of, uh, you know, the thinking, whenever we want to monetize our investment, we have to think that this company can be desired by 15 different uh, strategies strategies or an IPO marketing or an IPO in the US. So it has more options to grow and to uh, increase our stake. And the last thing, which is a bit more, you know, of a feeling is where in its history can it change courses and uh, stumble into something better. And the example of the contrary is that not having invested in Amazon because we thought that the, the market would be just too small. And Jeff Bezos said, you know, as he said in 97, he came, he said, it's the world's largest bookstore. He would do books. And the Lord, uh, it wasn't worth $200 million, which was what he wanted to raise in terms of capital. Of course, obviously he migrated to something completely different and uh, uh, books were the first uh, choice. So you have to see if that kind of uh, uh, em entrepreneur or business might have some kind of positive changes in its course. Perfect, Martin. Let us continue. I guess Alex is no longer here. No, oh, I'm here. I'm back, I'm back. <laughs> Technical issues here, I'm back. So Paulo, uh, when you find something that has everything you refer to, I was uh, listening to a podcast the other day, you were mentioning the uh, safety margin uh, and you were referring to one of great proposals in terms of uh, safety margins of this principle. But how do you consider this when you are assessing the business? How do you define or implement or consider this principle when you are looking into a business that will have the features you have just mentioned. Well, this is how I think, this is how I consider things. So let's say we're looking at a company that is worth uh, five times its revenues and the opportunity is ready for you. And you say, wow, I'm paying twice the, uh, how these companies are uh, negotiated in the market. So the uh, safety margin is to imagine that in five years, I will be the owner of this company at least once its revenue because it's growing faster than the other uh, companies that are being traded. So the safety margin, of course, will come from the mode, as Martin said, how sustainable the business is. But at the end of the day, the safety margin in terms of valuation of a company will come from its growth and how fast this company is growing and how fast you will become the owner of this company and with multiples that are greater than market multiples. This is just so, to give you an example. So 
This is something I always mention and mentioned in this podcast. Normally, uh, if you buy a company that they think the company is worth $100, in uh, five years, it will worth $110. It won't change value. Well, in a growth track company, today it's worth $100, but in five years, it will be valued $50. So you have to think about the growth of this company. So the safety margin is something that has to be dynamic, not static. You have to think not of the today, but maybe in X years. And we think in five years, that's our horizon. And each investor, of course, will think differently. We Some will say three years, some five, some 10, but we uh, choose a five-year horizon because it is where our imagination is able to reach. As Martin said, uh, the company can go into new segments, can change, you have, uh, so it's sometimes difficult to think about uh, beyond the five years. Yeah, perfect. Martin, how about you? It's interesting, since you, you know, you were telling everyone how old we are, how old we've, we've known each other, for how many years we've known each other, you lived the birth of the internet. Uh, and how do you see this uh, margin of safety now? And uh, what parallel do you make with the situation we're living uh, now and where we were at the end of the 90s? Well, to do a company valuation, a valuation of a company that is losing money, or to say the company that is worth 10 times its revenue, 100 times its revenue, will sometimes give the idea that uh, it's not a lot of science, it's just a bet, and that's it. It's implicit of what uh, Paul is saying in terms of the five-year projection. It's a concept that in the long term, every company is worth 20 times its uh, profit, uh, 15 times the EBITDA. But what will the moment be when the company will switch and become profitable and how profitable it be and when you bring to present value this is part of the business risk something that is not yet proven so the math is very simple as what we do in uh, uh, GP in 28 it's uh, multiples of EBITDA but in 15 years and uh, but of course you have to do so-called futurology that will be a bit more subjective some the technology segments are euphoric. Uh, WhatsApp group management. There's a tweeter, I don't know, Scott Morton, who said, if I never read The Intelligent Investor eight years ago, I would have been retired already. So those who made money in the last eight years uh, took a lot of risks because, you know, especially in the technology market, it, it grew uh, immensely. And if you invested in crypto in the last eight years, it's a genius, doesn't matter which crypto, they all grew between the 120 times. So it's a very delicate moment so that you will not just go with the flow and forget that in the longer term, we're all mortals, we all pay taxes and we all will be worth sometimes 15 times the EBITDA. So even though the market might be euphoric, not the euphoric now, the bases are very real. If you want to uh, refer to this and say, well, one million people bought uh, technology in Brazil. Today, you have 70% of the world population with access with a smartphone and uh, smartphones and navigation. Broadband is uh, ubiquitous around the world. The penetration of credit cards is even larger. Uh, cloud computing or artificial intelligence and what have you. So. The basis of the revolution and the gains of productivity that we are witnessing are there and it's real. And we see companies that had, you know, people that were considered crazy 10 years ago, like Facebook, Google today, they are profitable because they are worth trillions of dollars. So there is a lot more of foundation of basis, a lot more infrastructure. It is a wonderful moment to learn, to, uh, to invest, However, it is a euphoria. We know, uh, we know, you know, it's an euphoric moment. So when we have euphoria, you have to be careful. You have to take everything with a grain of salt. I would say that this is the story. And uh, 
And SoftBank is not complaining. So we are living a very interesting moment because we are losing uh, for some uh, funds that have a valuation that is twice what we said. So what Martin is saying is uh, really uh, what happened. The private market and uh, technology is believing that there will be an enormous rally in the uh, stock market in the next two years. They're trying to anticipate and buy uh, private companies with valuations that are even uh, a valuation available in the public market. And I'm scratching my head a little bit to try to understand it. And the only thing I can imagine is that uh, this exuberance will continue in two, three years. So uh, there will be also a monetary policy, fiscal global monetary policy that is expansionist, which will have a cost, a real cop cost of capital close to zero, at least uh, free uh, risk rates, uh, rates free of risk. And this will be translated in uh, expected returns uh, in macro market, capital markets that will be uh, greater than what we expected before. When I started my career in investments, we we're talking about 10% of uh, now it's uh, six, 7%. So when we include this in a uh, net present value in a company with a net, with a cash flow in nine, 10 years, you will have a 4% discount in this cash flow. It will be a GNPV a difference that is brutal today. I've seen and drew the scenario for a software company, and you have, for instance, a, a SAS company with a KE of 6% or multiple of 20, 15 times revenues, and with a KE of 10, and it's seven times the revenue. So you have a small difference of a KE and a difference in terms of NPV that is gigantic because the duration of the flow of cash flows is longer. Okay, well, taking this cue and going more into detail of how you think of, about the valuation of these companies, perhaps it would be worthwhile. You've done a lot of things with e-commerce and uh, things that I know like that. Don't you want to perhaps illustrate one or two of these companies applying in practice this concept that you're articulating how do you apply this in one or two cases? For example, I think this would help this discussion. Well, first of all, e-commerce penetration in Latin America, of course, is behind the rest of the world. So this shows that there'll be a lot of accelerated years of growth to come. This is the cool part. Number two, I would say, that a lot of bets have been made on e-commerce vertical companies, such as Net Shoes, for example, which didn't work out. And this made a lot of people be concerned in uh, investing in such companies. Then we started to analyze, maybe it won't work out, but Wafer or Chewy here in the United States that worked out in the vertical, competing with Amazon. And then we bet on Madera Madera and Pet Log, for example. So, because we think there is a way to compete with giants like Mercado Livre and Magalu with more vertical and other solutions. So, time will tell if we're right or not. We don't know. I would say that the idea is that there's a lot to build, the companies that tiny, the participation of companies in e-commerce is small, the participation of e-commerce in the whole is small. Why you put these things together, these two factors together, you're talking about 10 or 20 years of potential growth. Obviously, if you work well, if you work badly, of course, things won't work out. Yeah, I get it. Marching, you also have uh, several cases in other sectors, for example, uh, education, technology, do you have any examples of industries or cases where you apply the way that you look at these businesses, the way you evaluate them in order to help people that are following our panel to understand in practice how to do this? Of course, I'll give you two examples. A little bit about when you read the newspaper tomorrow, 20 years ago, we uh, uh, bet that the banks would lose a market share in the distribution of financial assets. You would not buy a pension plan 
from the same guy who sold you your mortgage or your bank. There was space for an independent player using digital tools that will give you biggest, a bigger opening of a larger variety of products. The banks had 80% of market share at that time. And we bet in one of the new banks called E-Trade in order to uh, be a disintermediary of the banks. And this from 80% dropped to 10. The banks lost the market. Uh, E-Trade Schwab uh, and others now Robin Hood, among others. So in Brazil, eight or nine years ago, 99% of the market was with the banks. And the ROEs of the Brazilian banks were the largest ones in the world, the highest one in the world. And what the clients got was limited with high tariffs, the highest tariffs in the world. So we looked at this from this 1%, two third, but with she's fair, XP. So this uh, Carioca thought he would be larger than Itaú. We thought this was quite cool, sort of a mad Carioca. That's a redundance, my goodness. And it has been an amazing journey from 99% to 92. Now it's the disruption is, is slower than in the US, but it continues in high speed, 50% growth per year, still in a large scale. And the same playbook, we use this in India and in China with funds in Hong Kong, which is the idea of using technology. So we recycle the idea. And every time you recycle an idea, you repeat a different mistake. Now, one of the ideas that was born in Brazil and became global has to do with distance learning. And this is actually funny. We were recruiting trainees in the ITA engineering school. And I said, well, the only people from from Ceará and what happens in Fortaleza, there are two schools that they're amazing. Two brothers that um, fell out with each other and, and they prepare people for college and it works very well and they get into ITA. So I got went to one of these colleges and one of the sons of the guy had done an MBA and he had sort of packaged the system from the school. He already had 60 schools in the Northeast using the system with amazing results. A thousand, two thousand, uh, he was getting placed in the NA using this technology. And our tech had been a huge failure uh, to disrupt education in the whole world. And I wanted to understand what this guy from Ceará was doing, how he was successful. And the idea of ID and his father, Otto, was to make the teacher embrace technology, to make it easy for him to understand technology, because the big barrier is that the students understand much more than the teacher. So he loses authority when he can't use the minimum of the minimum. So you have to have a platform that works not for the student, but for the teacher to start with. And this insight helped us to understand that it's a new tech phase today uh, the first Brazilian company uh, in NASA, they have a market cap of $90 million. They have 1 million and a half students using their platform. It's, it's quite amazing. But that idea that was born in Brazil, we've recycled this 12 times. But now we have companies in, in Indonesia, United States, in India, starting with this small insight of how important the technological platform that should be teacher friendly. Wow, that is amazing. Now, Paolo, taking the opportunity of this example that you said that things that you did in the past and trends that you identified one way or another, and you then generated opportunities for investment. When you look forward, where, what are these trends? Where are they? Um, uh, is it sort of more highlighted in Brazil and Asia or other countries in Latin America? If you talk a little bit that would about this, that would be very interesting. I would say, especially in China or Southeast Asia, 
they have much more to do with Latin America than the United States. So, for example, we study a lot together with the Quinto Andar, the business model of KE Holding, which is Becca. It's a company that uh, the same problem of a lack of an integrated system of listing of apartments. Normally, there are a lot of duplicates in the site. You never know what's still valid or not. So you create a whole system to organize this information. You generate incentives with the brokers. And that's what we're doing now with a company called Quinto Andar. Uh, I joined after Martin, but we're very optimistic. We think it has a huge potential. It's doing super well. So where is the inspiration coming from? A lot from China, at least on my point of view. I'm only one of the board members. So, for example, what is being done in what Tencent done in, in China with the super app? or the main consolidator of traffic, and then they invest in other companies of the same sector, and they utilize this flow of information to monetize, and meet one, Pindu do. This way of thinking is unique, and I think it's very interesting. And I ask myself, why don't the Latin American companies do that? They have that old sort of concept that has to be the owner of the company. I think this is... Um, a lost opportunity for large groups in Latin America. Martin, what, what about you guys? Where are you in, in terms of trends or geography? Where do you see opportunities such as this one that you talk? For, for example, where are the opportunities moving forward? Well, I'm... If you have a real good one, tell me privately later, right? Well, in context, Alex took me to GP, then I went to the company because if he's there, I'm there. So then he went back to the fund and I went back to the fund. And then I went to the US and I had to go to the US as well. So I followed him. And when I came back to the US, I said, Alex, it's full of Brazilians who go to the US and they don't work out. They stay one or two years and they return. Uh, you're here for over 10 years and, and have success. What is the trick? Tell me how things work. And he said, there's no mystery. In the US, it's a highway with five lanes, and you have to have your foot on the accelerator. Here, it's a highway with holes and potholes, and then it's, it's very different. You can't drive the same way. And the idea that I had is I want to be part of supporting, and Paolo was in, with me in one of these opportunities. Uh, Brazilian companies that turn into global companies, leaders and adopting certain technologies. So when I invested in Jim Pass, my, my idea it is with Caesar and Caesar is the CEO. I said, well, come to the five lane highway here and Jim Pass in two years, we build, built what it took seven years in Brazil, it's number one in the US, in Europe, Asia. And it's so, one is so proud to see a Brazilian technology company making history. The same thing, Hopmart, it's a platform of sales of online courses, which is going to make uh, 8 billion GMV. This multiplied by eight, more than half of the businesses outside Brazil number one in the US, number one in Brazil, Latin America, and also in several uh, countries in Europe. They're two guys from Minas. They're ambitious. So I'm very, very motivated with the idea of taking this entrepreneurship to the rest of the world. And Paulo is with me. And the cool thing is how quickly he created a digital product in the middle of the pandemic. He began talking and then two minutes later the product was ready what impresses in caesar is this capacity 
well, he would win against anyone in the US or China. He's spectacular, spectacular. He's, a, he's privileged and he's a simple, a cool guy. It's easy, he's likable. I like him a lot because of this. Another area that I'm betting on a lot is the usage of technology to, to solve uh, health issues. So the cost of health, well, it, in, in the US it's 80% of the GDP and it, they're often poor outcomes. There's a lot of waste and the technology can help for sure. We have about 30% of the portfolio of the technology in Latin America and less, but we can clearly see that problem that you're talking, for example, about educating the teacher and to overcome the barrier. Imagine a doctor who thinks he's God, regulated system where the reimbursement incentives are not aligned with the average outcome. So it's a huge problem but artificial intelligence can help a lot. Now to make this work within a reimbursement system, a complicated system such as help is for intelligent people, such as the Stanford students who are listening to me today. Wow. Well, it, it, it's a, a cool story. Uh, uh, there's a company in China called Pinin Doctor. They created an ATM machine where you put your hand, you measure your blood pressure, you measure if you've got fever or not, you answer a few questions, you get out with a ticket and you uh, get the medication on a machine next door. This is possible in China because the government favors efficiency. So if you have a lobby of doctors, uh, so in China, the engineer is the winner. What is cool about the pandemic is that this has accelerated this technology adoption. So telemedicine that uh, Marcin has just invested in, this type of thing was prohibited in Brazil. And then the pandemic came and that is not prohibited anymore because it's the only way that you can attend your clients. So now it's an acquired right. It's like Uber. In the beginning of Uber, everyone says no, but the unions of cab drivers won't allow it. And then after the Uber experience, they said, why do I need regulation of rights to go into a cab? So then everyone thought this was totally irrelevant and not necessary, the regulation. And the pandemic then has, uh, a lot of changes have taken place and changes that would normally take a long time to happen. Well, talking about opportunities that technologies can bring us in health, which is something that has always been important due to the size of this in the economy and this pandemic putting all this, uh, what does, you've just said, what has COVID, uh, what do you think COVID will create or will accelerate or not? things that were already existing. What do you think, Martin? COVID is digital acceleration. If you didn't know how to buy online or order food online or do the supermarket, now you know for sure. If you haven't learned it, you're not here. So this was also uh, distance learning, the teachers that were refusing and now there's not one teacher in the world that hasn't learned uh, to le the technology. So part of this change is temporary. So there's a group of people, uh, for example, who are buying the supermarket. But my mother-in-law, she loves going to the supermarket. And the day she can go back, she'll go back to the supermarket. Because she goes. She likes going and choosing her tomato. It's part of her routine. She's gourmet, etc. But 80% no. So the most long-lasting is a bit of what Paula said: regulatory changes thanks to COVID. For example. A lot of things have notary offices, for example, have digitized the, uh, <laughs> he's talking about digital signatures, a company that's better than DocuSign, telemedicine. It's marvelous. You're not gonna go back to go to a 
someone's at the office of a doctor is going to ask you the same thing 40 times and every time you, you no one keeps formulas so all of this are things that won't go back well i'm in my office in miami today i came to work here with my team and the first thing that i noticed today is how inefficient i am uh, then when I work at home with Zoom the whole time, because this is not this sort of chat here, someone goes and has coffee with you, lunch with you, you produce much more. So in the future, I see a market place much more distributed, much less concentrated. This has huge implications for real estate. You're going to be able to live wherever you wish with your family and then once a week or once a month you go someone somewhere to meet the team of your company to socialize so i think that some technology changes before the pandemic already were like the remote force now i see many more companies going to the remote force after the pandemic and another thing the search for talents for example, software engineers, before the guy would say, well, where are the largest number of people in Sao Paulo? Now, now they said, well, can we recruit someone from East, Eastern Europe, from India? Can we, where are talents uh, in the world? So these borders, they no longer are local of a city within Brazil, but they're now global. So the way of you setting up a business changes. Some Brazilian companies already use this type of talent, but from now on, I see an acceleration of this type of thing. So I think the way in which we work, for example, the Brexit guys, we're not investors, for example, but the, it's remote force. They don't have an office anymore. Each one works wherever he wishes. So the idea is to attract interesting people. I think there'll be an industry in the future of, to do the social capital of companies, which will be events where you go once every quarter to find out who the rest of your team are because you all work at home. Well, wow, cool. Well, just to add one area is biotechnology. So now that we understand what is MR, imagine the potential in the whole world to address problems such as cancer, for example. And we're going to have 2 million people who are going to receive a vaccine, which is 100% the protein manufactured that simulates a virus and makes your body prepare itself against it, developed in a couple of weeks. Uh, after the genome of the virus was mapped. So this is totally mind boggling. It's a revolution in biotechnology, which I think uh, a user case will show there's gonna be more money, more companies, and we will be, we will have our hundredth birthday, Ale. Yes, that will definitely be good. Yeah, COVID has certainly expedited certain things, some things that won't go back and uh, some that will, uh, show just the tip of the iceberg and the great potential it is. So great, I guess we could sit here and talk for hours and hours, I know, but it would be interesting to hear what uh, people have to ask and we should try to answer these questions. Samuel, would you like to help us uh, see what are the questions and maybe put them in order? Boa, vou mandar aqui no chat para ajudar Great. todo mundo. Mas a primeira... I'm going to send them on the chat. The first question is from Jorge Paulo. How do the new uh, technology changes change the uh, business associates and the type of people that you should recruit? Can we train people better or worse, depending on that? Jorge would like to have the answer for everyone except mine. We uh, talk about this, so it's for both, Martin and Paulo. So what was clear is that everything you learn becomes obsolete faster. 
And to memorize this is a total loss of time. Because you with, not you with your daughter, Alex, but when my question, when my daughter asked me something, I will just guesstimate whatever, because she, in 30 seconds, she'll say, that, that isn't it, you know. So this kind of knowledge is irrelevant. The most important figure, uh, and I work with many uh, youngsters, and it is a pleasure for us to do so, it is, you know, what is difficult is not to become a fossil or fossilize. It is to throw out the window your paradigms. You forget you had the wrong paradigms and you accept a new one and that's it just because it's new. It's a, a very little dogmatic and is always ready to reinvent and experiment and he's less worried of failure and they will learn faster. This kind of mentality which was important, is even more important now, and for us that are becoming more mature, is to keep this flexibility, you know, to go dive in. I guess it's interesting when you have to do this, what you were just describing, within organization. In an organization, and uh, what uh, is amazing is that the challenge is sometimes greater when you have a winning uh, organization. The organization uh, acts in a certain way. And many of these features uh, should and be, be, should be preserved and would need to be adapted. And some will have to be absolutely uh, revolutionary. And this capacity is what's gonna make a difference between different companies in 10, 15 years that have already benefiting these companies and will continue to do so. The greater organizations are great hierarchies and they are ver vulnerable to this. You know, when they work well, they won't let people leave the hierarchy. Going back to Georgie's question, you know, those who just joined our group, for instance, we see the great need of coming into the office to learn with uh, those who were already here for two, three years doing this work. It's difficult to teach these people in a full home office mode. It's difficult for them to really, you know, absorb the culture of a company. The irony is that the greater, the more senior you are, the less you need to come to office. The younger ones need to come to the office. That's the first point. The second point I see is we try to choose people according to their attitude, curiosity, proactivity. This is what makes a difference in terms of uh, traditional hiring. A person that has a positive attitude is because they had an ad, uh, education focused on emotional uh, intelligence. And uh, the other guy is saying, it doesn't matter if the professor is right or wrong. They are uh, Googling it to make sure if it's right or wrong. And they will learn and change and uh, do it by, by themselves because they won't expect the college to teach them because everything they believe is outdated. This is curiosity. And the third thing is creativity. To be exposed to different things in life, different things, to be connected to all these different points. And this is sometimes difficult to teach to the newcomers. You don't need a college for all that. I guess in 20 years, my daughter will not go to college. I don't think she'll go to college. Uh, Paolo Passoni, you were talking about uh, this very important point, and also before you referred to this, the young people who are now joining companies where you are investing or in the soft or in SoftBank themselves, how can they remotely, how do you do this remotely for these companies or these people to start to breathe the company culture, whatever culture that is? How do you do this uh, onboarding, this integration, this cultural onboarding without a physical presence at the office? So it's a practical question I have to you. We have one hour a day, we go into a Zoom and we talk about whatever without any specific agenda. And the person will sort of little by little seeing how the company works, seeing you know what is being said. It's like a, like a two box making a meeting or maybe a happy hour, professional happy hour, one hour every day. So for people who are joining the company, we'll allow this. But as soon as 
COVID is done, maybe in the second half of the year we'll go sort of back to normal. I think about the concept of bringing everyone together in one single space and to do cool things, not in terms of work, you know, to go camping in the middle of nowhere or a surf camp or something different, whatever, that you can actually uh, know the human beings behind the social security number so that you have more human approach, you know, that you have more sensitivity that way. And in our budget is now the budget, the budget for offsides, four times a year, we are offside. This is very important. I'm trying to imagine different situations of what the future holds for, to, for us, but I guess this is it. Yeah, cool. Uh, it, it's interesting, when I was young, I, well, more in the US and young people here, I guess in Brazil too, you know, we will get there a little bit later, but we will. First, the they are more worried now with the work-life balance. They demand this from the company. So the company will have time to think, time to go home, time to work and not be working late every day. Did you have a good uh, work-life balance when you were an analyst? No, no, we were like 100 hour weeks craziness, yeah. In the beginning, I thought, uh, it was the start of the decline of civilization, the American civilization, because now they're really focused on work-life balance. I am reinterpreting this because what you want from your worker is that they develop a knowledge. It won't be an 100 hour week that they will you know, pick up this knowledge. They need a pause for the insight. So the work-life balance is adequate for the knowledge worker that you want to have in your company. And the other thing that uh, is also very important is the purpose. If the company doesn't have a noble proposal or purpose aligned with his values, he's, he'll leave the company and he's right to do so. We were the wrong ones that didn't align our purposes with our company purposes. This uh, part which relates to having time to think before a turning point, Every Friday, I would go to work in my in my beach house close to New York. And then I say people, and I said, wow, you are really like, you know, you're really a smart ass, aren't you? you now to start your weekend uh, Friday morning. I say, no, this is the moment I stop and think that I won't have a meeting. This is the time I have to read to try to understand what happened during my week, where things are going. Most people go into that, you know, hamster wheel and they never leave and they can do anything interesting what is worthwhile are the insights that no one else had it's not the insight that everyone has what we want is the insight that no one else had you can just go to the internet and read social media to conclude this block to pass the floor to Samuel for the next question is that we the three of us we were analysts in the you know difficult times next question Samuel the next one is from Alessio CEO of Pipe5 uh, do you see a business opportunity uh, for Brazilian uh, focus uh, locally instead of global uh, citizen, global investments? Martin? Two companies uh, from Alessio, uh, the global customers, and uh, there's another one called Rocket Chat. It's an open source chat for companies. It's pretty interesting because all the information won't be inside a server. It is, it's inside the server. So the uh, department, the defense uh, department, the US uses Rocket uh, Chat because it will be uh, controlled. And Rocket Chat started globally since the beginning. And I can see these companies such as Rocket Chat, these are software companies SAS service as, uh, but this product has to be the best of the best globally speaking. And sometimes there's these, you know, mind boggling things that, uh, uh, you know, the people that are able to do this, it's rare, it's rare. Uh, normally they start with a more local product, but if you think you have a cool product and then then go global, start global. If you're born in the US, you can do local because the US is the greatest market in the world. 
if you're born in Israel, you have to be global because Israel is this big. So we are halfway between these two things. It's big enough to be dangerous enough and uncomfortable enough. So if you're focusing just in Brazil because it's big enough, it has to be a business with lots of a local customization so that the global player won't do away with your business if you have, don't have this customization or not have a tropicalization. If you're going to go global, you have to define a market and a market that you can win in. And in the world, there are people that are very, very good. You can do it, but you have to be very clear in, in terms of your target market. And for the world, it's what you did in your companies, Alex. You have to bring good talents <laughs> the best you can. You have to have the best guys. If you go to India, you have to bring the best Indian guys to complement your uh, team in uh, India. Same if you have a, a team in China. You have to be local everywhere you go. Okay, so Samuel, next question. The next question is from Nicholas. Education is a very important sector with a many positive externality, but technology has a difficulty in penetrate. What do you like about the sector, education in this case? Yeah. I guess Martin, yeah, I guess it's one of the best investments ever and uh, Hotmart. And I would say that how are you able to have a positive virtual experience for a student that will be efficient in terms of content generation, but at the same time engaging? Because uh, if you want it or not, when you go to school, you know, because that's where you meet your friends, this is where you socialize. So using just technology, technology will come to add to something that is done offline, not only to just replace, but having said so, if you want to learn English, coding or something specific, you will probably have a 100% digital product uh, driven to you. This is how I see it. It's a case by case, but it's a mix and match of offline and online. In my opinion, the future of education is a permanent education, short duration video. Hotmart is benefiting from this, but there are many companies in the world. You have to uh, constantly uh, update yourself. You will end up having different, you know, two, three, 10 hour uh, short video that was going to be fun, funny, dynamic, and that you will be constantly updating. Next question from José Sérgio Nogueira. Why is the dollar valuation in the growth equity Brazilian companies is more resilient than those that are negotiated here in reais, given the same addressable market? If you uh, open your capital uh, overseas, are you already a winner? Now, that's an illusion that the dollar valuation, when you get to growth equity, we have to have things in local currency. If the price is negotiated in dollars, but you know everything that is driving it behind is a local currency. This is uh, the story of um, that valuation done in dollars is a, an illusion. We always look at the numbers in local currency. How do you see this, Martin? Well, some Brazilian companies that uh, have benefited of a deeper market with a greater liquidity overseas. And the leader companies uh, that are listed, the Latin American ones, have a greater resilience. As so something we were talking about, Mercado Livre positioned as a leader company uh, in commerce in uh, Latin America for 20 years. And uh, it's, uh, for 10 years has been 20 times its revenue. It, it, it's still uh, deficient, but it's worth uh, a lot because it is clearly seen as a leader company. It is innovative, it behaves very well and it uh, reinvents itself. So there is an opportunity for Brazilian champions uh, to be uh, listed overseas, to be able to have a good valuation and uh, have a 
longer benefit of the doubt. So in the sense, they will have more sustainability in the margin, but technically correct. You know, at the end of the day, Mercado Livre is listed in Brazil or in the US should be valued in the same way. Isn't there a difference, Martin, a practical difference between the shareholder basis and this difference that will sometimes be driving a difference in evaluation? Um, and duly according to what? No, for instance, uh, uh, all, fee, all ends equal, uh, the, the company will be evaluated off sea overseas greater than it is in Brazil or not? It's a question. I like to list my companies in the US. I'm going to, you only like good things. That's already a good tip for everyone. But Alex, I would say, um, what happens here? What, everybody starts an investment, starts uh, with Benjamin Graham and value invest. The Brazilian market, equity market is new. So everyone in Brazil is value investor and everybody's learning how to do a growth. When a growth company is going to do an IPO, they will do a roadshow with the infrastructure in Brazil. Everybody will ask, what is your next quarter uh, EBITDA? If you're going to talk to capital, capital will say, what is your vision for 10 years? So. It is a completely different discussion. It's cooler for the entrepreneur to talk about, to talk to capital, because a guy in Brazil wants to trade the next quarter's EBITDA, and you don't even have an EBITDA. Yes, this is what I'm talking about. This is uh, what is behind the basis of investment, the difference between investors in Brazil, and it will drive different valuations, you know, with a different positive margin for those who are overseas. But, uh, and the second version, we are strong, starting to understand growth equity. We are starting to change the mindset. Funds such as Genomo, Atomo, VED, Constellation, there are many. Uh, these guys are global level. These are global level investors and they know what's going on. They will start having a dialogue with high quality companies. It's the same dialogue you will have with capital. The advantage of capital is that they will look around the world in terms of what type of sectors and they have all the benchmarks. They know what it is in South Korea and in India and in China, whatever. So they are a specialist of that business model. In the longer term, the specialist in the business model is the winner. So how do I explain these to everyone? It's We're not a Latin American investor. We are investors in mo business models that are applied to Latin America. So the first step is to understand the business model. So there's a certain specialization of business model. This is what's gonna be the winning ticket in the longer term in the mature markets. But even uh, if you're listed in the US, you can't forget about the Brazilian investor because in the US, we'll get scared with Brazil when it's five years horizon. No, now we are a bit scared with the current issues. But then you have to have uh, less scary uh, investors. So it's important to access both capital markets, but you know, the local money is as important as international. I guess the two conversations are important to, it's important to keep. The next question is from Fernando ICTS. The examples given by you are B2C. What are the successful B2B examples you could refer to? Vitex is B2B, Illness is B2B, Jim Tez is B2B, B2B2C. So I have uh, some, what else, Martin? Payment, the local is B2B, Clip. Uh, square, the Mexican square is B2B. 40% of my portfolio is B2B. So of course, these are less popular brands, not as well known. One third is XP, is B2B, it's institutional. So I don't know. Um, it's, I, get, I get more fun to talk about B2C, but B2B also makes money. Well, the uh, risk adjusted, uh, the, the industry that gave brought us more money in b venture capital was a software as a service, the SAS. This is the game that, you know, Americans love to play. This is the highest uh, risk ratio game. Of course, the more capital uh, in the loss model of the strategy, you have to care for it in the longer term. And this kind of return, uh, which is very high, will fall, of course, in time. Well, the next question, 
Let's try to get a YouTuber to also mix and match. The question is addressed to Alex from Kawifehir. Alex, what is your understanding of SG and how can companies uh, draw value from it? I guess ISG today is important uh, for all companies for many reasons. Uh, for one reason, actually. Today, this is something that you uh, bring the right thing together, the, what you have to do with what makes sense to do for that business. And it makes sense because people who will work in the company and the firm, as Martin has just said, in terms of the reality we had that five, 25 years ago, they are more worried today in working in a company that has the right purpose, as Martin said, a consumer, which at the end of the day is a great sovereign, the ruler of what will or will not happen to companies in terms of the uh, uh, B2C companies. And this is, uh, uh, they are more and more sensitive to uh, ESG issues. So um, this will allow the company look into the supply side very carefully. So uh, ESG today is something that is essential to any company, again, because it's the right thing to do and because it's what makes sense to do for the company and the business. Well, the next question, uh, we have five. Uh, can you tell us about some lessons learned, things that didn't work out? A lot of lessons learned, I think. First of all, you chose the wrong team. You thought it was a certain way, and then six months later, you discover it's not like that. It, it, it's very quick for you to notice the mistakes that you've made in six. You see that that wasn't exactly what you were told, or you didn't understand it properly. Uh, or you chose the wrong team. I think that's the main lesson then. So there are several ways of you do doing diligence in teams. And if you don't do this adequately, you pay the price. So I think this is one point which is a big lesson learned. And another lesson learned is that there are some industries which are very expensive to generate a winner. So either you're, you're going to a fight for five or six years and pay, play the chess game, or it's better for you not to enter because it won't end in the initial uh, investment. It starts there and you're going to have to invest additionally in this company to make sure that it's a winner of the game. Otherwise, so I think that you have to understand what is the game that the company is playing and you have to be available to fund this during the life of the company. So these are the two lessons learned for me, at least. Well, to deal with the government is extremely complicated. So when you do something wrong, you don't do it again. We have a lot of uh, fears of capital intensive industries. Uh, so we need people that are more competent, people like Alex to Alex doesn't like this either, Martin. <laughs> Sometimes we lose ourselves in shortcuts, in wanting to do something that's not that good, but we think that the market will appreciate it or it'll... And in the end, when you try to when you try to fool a third party, you're fooling yourselves. You can temporarily uh, fool someone, but it's not worth it. And it's very tempting. It's very tempting. And it's very tempting when there's an euphoric uh, market, when everything goes. But this is a long-term game. And the shortcuts, in my experience, they've never worked out. Yeah, and it's tempting because the evaluation is cheaper and then it becomes expensive. I've made this mistake a few times and I continue making this mistake. I look back and I say, wow, well, why did I do this? I should have paid more and the other guy, which was more expensive, simplify life, bet on the best and that's it. So I think this is an important point. 
Next uh, question comes from George, George uh, Paulo Martin Alex. If you were uh, graduating today, a University of MBA, where would you put your careers? And he said, you cannot recommend your own companies. Well, of course, Alex, once he gave us a lecture, I was very young listening to him in the Studar Foundation. And he said, if you're starting your career, go somewhere where things are growing, because if the pizza is not growing and just being cut in smaller and smaller, then don't do this. So this really was something that I remember. He doesn't know, but it was a strong point. So where is the pizza growing now? Venture capital. Well, you have a qualified person and everyone on this panel is, well, start a company. Don't come to work with us. I tell my team, leave, start your own company. What are you doing here working for us? Leave. We'll invest in you. Raise capital. It's very easy to raise capital for qualified people. So leave. That is my recommendation. Don't come to work with us. Go and start your own business. Well, two ways to respond before giving the floor to Alex. First of all, there's the part of opportunities, the biggest opportunity looking forward 10, 20 years is when you'll be at your peak. You, you have to look fast forward 20 years. So everything that sustainability, green tech will be doing very well or else the climate change has heated the world and the world has ended. So I think anything green will have a long cycle and biotech as well. That's something else that I believe is a game player for 20 years but of course it has to suit you it can be really cool but if you hate biology and chemistry and you don't like studying don't go to biotech and often these questions induce to the mistake and you think there's the same answer for everyone there isn't for my my oldest daughter is not biotech she's probably listening to me something else you have to uh, look at who the person is I think it's difficult to add anything to what you said with these old examples and you go giving you go giving me the sensation that I'm much older than you, which is not very fair. But two things. Well, look what is growing and something you like because it's going to be competitive, of course. So you have to like it. Now, it's difficult to disagree with what Paolo said, it's never been so attractive or easy to start your own business one way or another. I think it's difficult to argue against that. Okay, last question is Alexandri. He says, what are the trends to digital products that you see in the energy market with the technological market and the advance of the free market of energy and deregulation in Brazil? Uh, electric vehicles, batteries, so on and so forth. That's difficult in Brazil because Brazil is behind. We invest in five sectors, 32 business models in energy twice in the 40 years. And we understand that we discover that we don't understand a thing because the two times we and we invest it's one of the most complicated sectors for you to make money the capex commodity price risk very regulated the government has a huge role everything that i don't understand so i'll let someone else take that question it's a cool company I, that I has have, has a good future. I think uh, they're, they're installing solar panels and selling energy on the grid. The grid is not ready to receive this energy in Brazil. So uh, that's why I say Brazil is way back because the regulator is not ready to support the distributed electricity. It's not there yet. We're actually quite far from there. But I think we'll get there. I think they're competent people in the sector and we'll get there with solar energy, wind energy, batteries to regulate the system. 
it's a difficult sector, I would say. And uh, electrical vehicles is a global game. You're not going to invest in a Brazilian company, perhaps electrical motorcycles, that's something else that perhaps would be more feasible, but to try to replicate a Tesla in your life, good luck, especially since it's been evaluated at where five billion dollars, uh, the market cap one percent, you can't compete with this value, you better not even try. But yeah, I think those are some loose thoughts. Any other question? Well, I think if there's any other question, but I think we're within our time frame here. Well, I believe that we can then end. Those that are listening to us, we are in an era of opportunities. It's a good time to be young. It's a good time to start, to start life again. I would say that the second derivative of the change is that things are accelerating. So try to visualize the world in five or 10 years and invest because everything's going to change. Everything's going to change very fast. So try to understand who are the guys that are more intelligent than you that understand where the world is going and move together. I'm not that smart. So I try to go together with people as smarter than me. And I go into the, I latch onto the bandwagon. So this is the main, my main idea. When I was the age of a lot of you, a lot of you, I was a bartender. When I was serving gin and tonic for the guys who are now my age, about 10 people told me, wow, Martin, 18 years old, I'm 50, it goes so fast, it goes so fast. And now I'm saying the same thing for to the bartenders. So the truth is it goes very, very fast. And the only way for you not to feel that life has gone too fast is not to be so concerned about the future in 20 years. I would like to have heard Martin of 50. Okay, f f focus on today. The future solves itself. Focus on today. Really cool, guys. I'd like to thank the three of you, Alex, Martin, and Paolo. It's a wonderful panel. Everyone is praising a lot. I'd like to thank all our team, everyone who has followed this, a lot of people and all the sponsors who are listed here at the back of me and that support us every year. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you all at the next panel. Thank you. Bye-bye.